And hello again, everyone, as we return to our lectionary study here for this first Sunday in Lent, February 21st, 2021. Um, the Old Testament reading for this particular Sunday in our, <coughs> in our three-year cycle is from Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. And, and it's, it, it's a very familiar passage with Abraham and, uh, you know, God testing him um, as a way to uh, where he's, he's asked to bring Isaac up to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him. Um, what we so often look at is, is, you know, it's like, how could God possibly ask that? And then the whole question of how does it fit in the whole bigger context of not only our Lenten readings, but then also the bigger biblical um, biblical narrative, and especially the way in which James wrote that God tempts no one, um, you know, all these sorts of things along the way. It becomes one of these fascinating readings as we look at it, so that as we look at it, tempting someone and testing their faith is two different things. And um, the good Lord does allow a lot of things to happen within our lives in order to test our faith. But if we just look at it strictly on that level, we miss the bigger picture where this passage here with Abraham and Isaac and how the Lord provides the lamb and all of these kinds of things, it becomes one of these um, narrative, um, story-based, um, but narrative, history-based um images of Christ in the fulfillment of what God himself will provide in the person of Christ. And the reason we have it here right at the beginning of Lent is in the midst of all of this call to repentance, gospel reading, um, James with the insights into how, you know, on our inner lives, in our inner selves, we wrestle and struggle with desires and sin as well, um, that that here from the Old Testament reading, we have held before us this beautiful Old Testament passage, which points to God sending his son, really an Old Testament, um, uh, you know, picture of John 3.16. Um, and as we listen to this, how God through Abraham had promised to send that that seed, that savior, the one that would be the the one that would um, not only be the one that would fulfill the, the early Genesis promise of crushing the serpent's head, but then also as the promises begin to unfold from here that that um, through through Christ, you know, the descendants and, and, and those who receive that inheritance of heaven um, are, are basically, they, they'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand, as sand on the sea, the seashore. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we give thanks to you for the testimony and the witness of, of your word, which rooted in the past and rooted in genuine history, um, real history, not only shows how you've interacted with the people of, of your choosing throughout, throughout the generations, but especially today as we look into this passage, how you use all of these words and all of these witnesses, even the way that John uh, writes in his gospel. These things are written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ to point us to your most wondrous gift of your own son being given for us and for our salvation. Bless us as we carry these passages with us as we wander through this journey of Lent for this year um, so that we would be strengthened through that wonderful gift of, of faith and life and peace that comes from you, the Father of lights. This we pray in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Passage becomes longer and... Um, but but it's a it's a beautiful passage. So let's let's read through it, and and you know dig into the text. So Genesis twenty two, beginning at verse one. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Okay, so God calls out to Abraham. Abraham responds, you know, and God had given Abraham this proven, a promise that even though he and his wife Sarai Sarah were barren, that he would give them a son. Um, they tried to do it in their own kind of human way where Sarah said, well, I'm barren, so how about you go and take the, the maid? And then, you know, which was not uncommon during that time. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, as we listen to this, they tried to create an offspring um, based on God's promise, and then they ran with it in a completely wrong way. Um, warning that we shouldn't be careful not just to use Scripture in a way that seems good to us, but that we learn to allow Scripture to form us. 
the descendant of Abraham was to be a descendant of God's promise and God's working, and God provided that in the child Isaac, who, interestingly, um, the name Isaac means laughs. He laughs, or she laughs in this case, because, you know, as, as Sarah was standing behind in the curtains of the tent and listening to the angels that had been sent to Abraham to tell him he was going to have a child, um, that, that Sarah just giggled and she said, yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, right, you know, how is that going to actually work? Well, and here she ends up having this child, and so he becomes named Isaac, he laughs. So here God calls out to Abraham, and he says, here, am I, here I am, or here am I. And he says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, not Moria, sorry, Tolkien fans, Moriah, um, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Okay, so he says, okay. Notice he doesn't tell him which mountain yet. This is the interesting thing for us. You know, we, we like to have everything planned out and have, um, you know, have a, a sight of exactly where things are going to go, where sometimes as we face life and encounter life and as the Holy Spirit um, uses God's word for us, we need to begin with the little bit that we have rather than allowing our minds to try and fill absolutely everything else in. Uh, because in the process, we, we might drive ourselves absolutely nuts and get lost from where we're actually at at the moment. Um, the, the whole idea of thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path says it's not a set of headlights which shows us the, you know, the bright sun shining absolutely everywhere so that you can see the exact layout of the land. Um, it provides light to where we are, where our feet are on the path at the moment. Um, and and this, this is beautifully reflected right here. It says, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So, detail, detail, detail. Just wait. Be patient. Trust in the Lord. You know, it's, uh, it, it's one of those things where, where so often we want to know what it'll be then rather than trusting in the Lord now. Um, and and um, this becomes important within our particular passage here. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And so he took two of the servant men as well as Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So when he gets there, God lets him know where it is. Okay, on that third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Now, third day... Um, yeah, of course, you know, we can see Trinitarian imagery in there, but uh, three days um, between between the the message and, and, and the fulfillment, um, between the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection, all of these kinds of things, third day, it's definitely an echo tying into the death and resurrection of Jesus. So here, <clears throat> third day, oh, lost my place. Okay. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And when Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Um, again, he says those words, um, I and the boy will come again. Um, there's perhaps a sense of faith, perhaps a sense of trust, perhaps a sense of uncertainty. Um, but it's interesting. He says these words will come, both come back. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and so they both went, both of them together. Um, notice who carries the wood. It's Isaac, who becomes this, this kind of a, an image of Christ here within this particular, particular passage. Christ carries the cross, Isaac carries the wood. Um, basically, uh, and, and the cross becomes the, the instrument of, of our Lord's crucifixion. Whereas here, in this particular case, the wood would have been used in order to, to offer up Isaac, but as we discover and as we know, um, the good Lord provides. And that's where we go right away. And so, um, so they went up together, and verse 7, and Isaac said to his father Abraham, because he's starting to clue in here a little bit, saying, my father, he said, here am I, my son, he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Okay, and so, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of weird, Dad. Um, what are we doing? And, and here, it's interesting, Abraham's response, and this becomes really the nugget for us to hold on to, not only as we go through Lent, and not 
only as we see this fulfilled in Christ, but then also as we face each and every moment along our way. Abraham said to him, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them, together. Those words are, you know, just absolutely beautiful for us. And, and it ties into the simple reality that um, we... We, as we take a look at our life situations and how we can get ourselves all anxious and worried about what tomorrow might hold or what might be four, four steps down the road, two steps down the road, even one step down the road, um, rather than worrying about the details, simply trust in the Lord right now that the Lord will provide the stance of faith the underlying meaning of the word for faith in the Hebrew language, or the Greek language, um, especially Hebrew language as well, is simply to trust. It's not to believe or to, to grab a hold of something and, you know, and, and think, think those thoughts as most excruciatingly as we can. It's to trust. Trust the Lord. God will provide. Um, and, and as we hear these words... You know, it, it's both that word of the comfort, it's gospel words spoken to Isaac, who's kind of wondering what's going on. And he's kind of wondering sort of along the way, is it maybe me? Um, because everyone else has been left behind. And as we see it unfold, indeed, God does provide. He provides for us. He provides that sacrifice for us, for our sins, to atone for our sins. In that most perfect way, <clears throat> where Isaac gets to be, you know, the Old Testament shadow, so to speak, the Old Testament image, which is fulfilled in Christ, the descendant of Abraham's own offspring, um, where God does do that work of saving humanity and blessing all of humanity. So verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now at this point in time I'm sure Isaac is kind of freaking out. We don't have that particular comment mentioned right here but you know Abraham does what he's been told to do. Okay notice though but you know the law leads us so far but ultimately it's God's grace um, which which redeems and saves. And this becomes a very important law gospel distinction here. And we need to keep it in mind for ourselves. Gospel is different from the law. Um, not that it does away with the law, but instead it provides for and, and fulfills the law for us on our behalf. And so here, as we take a look at this, you know, poor Isaac is being bound on top of this altar with all of the wood, and then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son, so he's ready to go and and um, basically, basically do the deed and offer his own son, the only child which God had given as a promise, which God said would be, um, would offer all of these offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. And here he's in his old age, and he and Sarah have not been able to have any children up until this point, and the hope of having children afterwards. I'm sure he was kind of wondering along the way, too. Sometimes our situations become very um, very nonsensical to the way in which we would look at it. And here we get to the point where that word which Abraham spoke, and those were prophetic words, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Verse 10, verse 11, sorry, but the angel of the Lord called to him, the messenger of the Lord from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I, those words again. Notice, he says, I'm not there, but you know, those words, there's beautiful content in them. Here am I, I'm here, I'm in the present, I'm hearing, I'm listening. Okay. And that becomes one of the real challenges for us within our faith lives. We hear but we're not actually listening. Here am I, like, okay, yeah, learning to be present in the moment before our Lord, to hear his word, so that his word can be that light to our path, and as, you know, to light up our way, uh, becomes important. Um, resist the temptation to always look five, five steps down the road, just right now, right now, and that's enough, because right now, is the only moment that we really truly have and tomorrow isn't promised tomorrow we might be in heaven with him in eternity we don't know that 
But right now, we still have the promises that Christ is with us to the very end of the age, baptismal promises. Okay, so verse 12, he said, do not lay a hand, this is the angel, he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So here's the test. All right. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So indeed, the Lord did provide. Okay, so Abraham called the name of that place. The Lord will provide. That whole theme, the Lord provides. Trust the Lord. The Lord will provide. Then it's put into the name of the place. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. And, and that becomes an expression which apparently um, had, was circulating around at the time in which Moses compiled and pieced together the book of Genesis. So as we hear all of these things, it's that, that call to that being present. Here I am. Here am I to turn our attention to the word of the Lord and to trust that he will provide. And through the lens of, of what Christ has done, we get to look back and say, indeed, God has provided very richly. And then learning, you know, together with, you know, James especially, to rest in that reality each and every moment and step along the way, rather than getting ourselves all riled up about what we think we don't have with that restlessness of our hearts. So verse 15, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Okay, interesting, the echo that comes in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the Old Testament image pointing to the fulfillment in Christ the Lord provides. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And there's that promise. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Okay. Um, now, here, there's the very earthly way of looking at it, which unfortunately a lot of these, these um, right-wing preachers will try and take that and run with it, saying, and see, it means that we will dominate the world politically. And yet the reality is, is that the fulfillment of it comes not with a political kingdom and a lasting political kingdom, but instead um, Jesus' kingdom of grace, the kingdom which is not of this world. And so in which he says before Pilate, if it were, I would have told my disciples to fight. Um, we have been made part of a kingdom where the gates that are talking about and the gate of his enemies is nothing other than the gates of, of hell itself, which which. Christ himself has basically torn open in order to bring up those who have fallen asleep. And, and that becomes not only what Peter writes about, where we get that line um, in the creed saying, and he descended into hell in the Apostles' Creed, um, but we also get these, these beautiful, beautiful early images that carried through and became a very standard image, particularly in, in um, Eastern Christian um, churches of the resurrection where Jesus is rising not simply from the grave for himself but actually pulling up um, a male and a female image um, representing Adam and Eve so right from the beginning of time to the end of time um, that that heaven basically has been open to also those who have fallen asleep before the time of Christ all through that gift of faith as we look forward and that becomes the juggernaut it's that gift of faith, law and gospel, right here where the law basically said, offer your son, and then God provides. Where the law says, you know, you need to do this, and I've tested you, but then the Lord provides a gift of grace. Um, so that it's not a matter that, as a result, Abraham sinned by not actually going forward and killing Isaac, but in, on the other, but, but instead you flip it around and say, you know, the law demands, you know, the wages of death because of our brokenness and our sinfulness. And that's the Old Testament sacrificial system, which pointed the way to Christ. Well, God makes the perfect sacrifice by sending his only begotten son to take on our humanity, the humanity of the whole human race, 
It's one of those interesting and quirky parts of old um, historical Christology, and it's very much present within our Lutheran theology as well, which um, unfortunately is, is denied by a lot of evangelical churches explicitly in their theology. Um, that, that Jesus takes on all of humanity, not just a particular human person. And as a result, what he does with that humanity is for the benefit of all of humanity, not only within a particular moment in time, but because he is the eternal son of God, it applies to all of humanity throughout time as it is brought into our lives even further and deepened as we are washed in forgiveness and all of these things and brought into, into that body of Christ and made... Um, made, made people that are hidden away in Christ as our refuge and our strength. So looking back, though, <clears throat> as a result, you know, this promise that God had given to Abraham, to Abram, that he would have a child and that through this child, he would, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Um, and then the way in which, well, he thought maybe it's Isaac, and then since Isaac, it wasn't Isaac, it was maybe it's, maybe it'll be Esau, and that becomes one of the interesting things along the way, because Esau, being the older son, would have inherited everything. Well, no, it was Jacob, the trickster, the younger son, even though they're twins, um, Jacob comes out second, and and God makes makes the choice, saying it's not the way in which you're going to think it's going to work out, it's going to be the way in which I work it out. And so here, this constant theme, the Lord will provide, the Lord will provide, trust in the Lord one step at a time as we go through all of this, and, and applying that to our lives in the full knowledge that the Lord has provided in Christ, that you have been baptized in Christ, um, you have died with Christ so that we are also joined with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Um, all of these elements apply to our lives so that, you know, as we take a look at all of the things that might drive us nuts, whether it's relating to family, job, church, COVID, whatever it might be, um, even relating to government within the country and all these sorts of things, um, don't go chasing after all of these these um, streams of thought where we want to lay out absolutely everything because the simple fact of the matter is is that the word of the Lord provides the lamp for our feet right now. And the Lord has provided, continues to provide right now, and will continue to provide. And so put your trust in him. Okay. So the offspring and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, Okay, the gates of hell. And in your offspring, notice singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed, heard both words um, resonate and move back and forth. It goes right back to what we've been talking about with how it's present both in the Hebrew but also then also in the Greek where, you know, um, obedience, basically, the actual unfolding of God's word starts with God's word and the hearing of it and then um, and beautifully tied to this weekend's readings, <coughs> learning to to wrestle in repentance with those those inner sides of sin, you know, the desire which then distorts the way in which we look at things, and <coughs> it all comes from hearing the voice of God. And for us, and for biblically. Um, by the time we get to the New Testament, <clears throat> it's made very clear that that hearing of the voice of God is not the extraordinary hearing where God speaks directly to Abraham or to a particular prophet. But it is hearing the voice of God as he speaks to us through the scriptures. Um, so as we do those sorts of things and as we, as we um, really allow the Holy Spirit to free frame ourselves and, and and discipline and reshape our lives so that we hear God's word clearly. Um, it's calling us back to ourselves um, so that we're, we hear the word in the here and now and not simply run on what we think we understand about it. Um, the understanding and the bigger picture is important in order to frame our understanding and to train ourselves. That's true, so that we don't go off on all kinds of different tangents that, have, that the church has wrestled through in the past. But the other side is, is that you know, we need to be present to hear God's word as he speaks to us in scripture, in church, in the sacraments. And with all of that, we have 
the promise of the blessing which has been fulfilled in Christ, where God has offered his only son, not only in the place of Isaac here, but in our place, in order to forgive our sins, to join us with him in his death, so that our death no longer becomes the end of us, but instead opens the door with Christ's resurrection to eternal life. All right, I think we'll leave it there. Beautiful Old Testament image right at the beginning of Lent that points us to Good Friday, the cross, where it is finished, so that we are able to celebrate that high feast and the highest festival of the church here, Good Friday, looking forward to the gift that comes through the resurrection as well. The Lord bless you during this week and you know, cement your feet right where they're at so that we can have open ears to hear God's word and to rest in his care and what he has provided. Amen.